right. Welcome back, Organic Chemistry 2341. This is our last, last lecture of the year. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish out module 11.1 .1 just right now. And then we're gonna also hit module 11.2, which is ethers. So in this chapter, we've learned a lot of things. We've learned a lot of things about e ethers. I'm sorry, uh, uh, alcohols and ethers. We learned about Grignard reagents, organometallic reagents, and we learned about how they do addition reactions on carbonyls, okay? Uh, we learned how you use more than one equivalent if you wanna do a carboxylic acid or a ester when you're using those organometallic reagents. We also learned about selectively reducing down that carbonyl, taking advantage of that partially positive carbon by using a negative hydrogen, a hydride, as the transfer agent, and you get selectivity. Now, you get selectivity not only with just carbonyls, but different types of carbonyls. A lithium aluminum hydride does more types of carbonyls than sodium borohydride does. Sodium borohydride only does aldehydes and ketones. Lithium aluminum hydride do carboxylic acids and esters as well. So you have selectivity in your reagents there. And then we learned about oxidation and reduction examples, and we went from going from uh, chromic acid, we knew that in the presence of water, you always convert your primary alcohols down to carboxylic acids. However, if you used a special reagent, PCC, in the absence of water, you could stop a primary alcohol at the aldehyde. All secondary alcohols, whether you use uh, uh, chromic acid, permanganate, or PCC, secondary alcohols always stop at the ketone. And it doesn't matter which oxidant you use, tertiary alcohols just never react, okay? So that gets us all the way to where we are with ethers. The other thing we learned about is the nucleophilic ring opening of epoxies or oxalates, okay? Remember, it is regioselective and stereoselective. So make sure that if you're building a, a reaction table for this chapter, you would wanna include those things in it. Okay, any questions on what we've had up in chapter 11 up to now? Okay, all right. Uh, our next exam is on Monday, correct? Uh, at this regular scheduled time, you go to Top Hat, you log in as normal and go ahead and get, uh, get on there. I will be monitoring live if you have questions. And then the next time we'll meet is on our final exam. So according to my notes, our final exam is on the 12th, which I think is a Wednesday, uh, the 12th of May at 11 a.m. So it's a little earlier than we're normally meeting, but the 12th is on a Wednesday. So we're gonna meet on Wednesday, the 12th for our final exam. Okay. So, but we're gonna, Go ahead and go to Top Hat on Monday for our number three exam here. The third exam is gonna be like the others, approximately 25 questions. The um, third exam is gonna focus on chapters eight, nine, 10, and 11. The exam will be comprehensive of chapters one through 11. Uh, and the final is also on Top Hat. So that makes it, uh, so it, we have a nice convenient. Again, look for the same style of questions, just look for more of them. There's approximately 60 questions on the final covering all 11 chapters. So uh, obviously you wanna study for eight, nine, 10, 11 first to get to exam three, but then you wanna go back and review modules one through seven as well. Okay, questions on the exam or the final. Okay. So that takes us to where we are now. So we've learned a lot about alcohols. Let's go ahead and continue with conversion of alcohols to better leaving groups. Okay. Now, when we started talking about nucleophilic substitution uh, or uh, reactions, we talked about how the leaving group needs to be a poor base. The weaker the base, the easier it is to leave, right? Which means hydroxide is a bad leaving group. Just trying to take an alcohol off directly is not possible. So what we need to do is convert the alcohol into something that will make it a weaker base when it leaves. And we have a couple different ways of doing that, okay? So the idea here is we did it before when we did an acid catalyzed reaction, right? We, we protonated that alcohol and turned it into a 
neutral leaving group of water, okay? So that was the first thing we did to make uh, alcohol a better leaving group. And that would look something like an acid uh, with uh, some kind of nucleophile dissolved in it. In this case, we're using uh, the conversion of a primary alcohol with sodium bromide to give us an alkyl bromide, okay? Now, we found out in chapter six that this does work for bromine, but not for chlorine because chlorine is not nucleophilic enough. So in the case of trying to convert it, we're having to make it a better leaving group. And we make it a better leaving group by getting a zinc oxygen bond. When we have that zinc oxygen bond, that's stronger than the carbon oxygen bond. And it's easier to pull it away as a neutral or as a salt with the zinc, okay? And then it can decompose and regenerate the zinc chloride. So we only need a little bit of a, a catalytic amount of that zinc chloride to be used. But it is required because HCl, the chloride, is not a strong enough nucleophile. Remember, in our nucleophiles, good nucleophiles were bromine, iodine, and then um, all the sulfur things with charges and oxygen things with charges. And then below that was chlorine and fluorine were in the fair nucleophile range. Because it's a fair nucleophile, we must use a catalyst to make it a better leaving group. Okay. So, in this case, we've made oxygen a better leaving group by binding it to a different element that it leaves with by making it a weaker base. We can do that with phosphorus as well. And we can convert alcohols into iodides, chlorides, or bromides by using a phosphorus uh, halide, okay? Now, in the case of uh, the chloride, we have two choices. We have phosphorus trichloride, which produce slightly different products and phosphorus pentachloride, okay? Slightly different mechanism when we produce slightly different products, but they both work. Now, we can also use uh, phosphorus tribromide to make the bromides. Phosphorus triiodide itself is not very stable, so we tend to make it in situ, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Now, these will work with primary or secondary alcohols because it does involve a, a nucleophilic substitution step, and therefore tertiaries don't work. And what we see in the, in the uh, example of phosphorus trichloride and phosphorus tribromide is that you can use, you can exchange all three of those halogens and generate a phosphorus tri, uh, a phosphoric acid derivative, uh, hydrated phosphoric acid in the process. So you can actually use three equivalents of alcohol, one equivalent of either of the trihalides and generate three equivalents of the alkyl halide and a phosphoric acid hydrate. Okay, now this doesn't work with the phosphorus pentachloride because what's gonna happen is it's gonna exchange one chlorine with the carbon. It's gonna use one chlorine to generate HCl and it's gonna make a stable compound called uh, phos uh, <clears throat> a pho a trichlorophosphine oxide, okay? It does not undergo the same reaction and therefore the reaction stops. So you can only do a one-to-one -one equivalent for that. Now, in the case of uh, phosphorus triiodide, you can exchange all three of those halogens to create that hydrate of phosphoric acid. However, it's not stable in the bottle, so you gotta make it in situ. You gotta put in your phosphorus, put in your iodine, stir that first, then add your alcohol. Okay. So each of these will create a primary or secondary alkyl halide just by choosing your phosphorus reagent correctly. So how does it work? Well, it works by the idea that we're going to go ahead and do kind of acid-base chemistry, okay? Your alcohol is gonna act as a Lewis acid, I'm sorry, Lewis base. Your phosphorus is gonna act as a Lewis acid and we're gonna create a complex, okay? And then when it exchanges, it creates this phosphorus trihydroxide after all of them have, which kind of rearranges to give us phosphoric acid, which is the dihydroxy uh, and the it's a total of five bonds around phosphorus here. This is actually the more stable. Remember, phosphorus is on one row down on the periodic table, and therefore it has available Ds and it can have more than an octet. That's why this is the favored structure here. Okay. So um, the reason it only works with uh, primary and secondary alcohols is because technically it is a true SN2 reaction. But the first step of the reaction is making the oxygen a better leaving group by making an acid-base complex with phosphorus first, 
once we create this acid base complex, our electrons come into phosphorus, kicking out our bromine here. Our bromine is now our nucleophile. And we now have not hydroxide as a leading group, but a neutral phosphorus, uh, uh, phosphine oxide. Okay, we have a neutral species leaving. So when our bromine comes in and attacks on the backside of here, we can kick this out as our neutral compound, which then can react with two more equivalents of alcohol to generate a total of three alkyl halides and our phosphoric acid. Okay. So the trick here is we did the exact same thing we do with the zinc or with the acid in the bromine one we generated something that was not hydroxide as our leaving group. <clears throat> in this case, we have an oxygenated phosphorus as a neutral leaving group that then can go on to do other reactions. Okay, questions on, the, on that reaction. So just to kind of give you a hint for the final, um, that means that this reaction go, undergoes stereoinversion. So if you were going to write a reaction table and you would want to talk about stereochemistry, you might want to say, oh, that might be stereoinversion. Okay. Okay. So the reaction is stereospecific because it does a SN2 reaction. It does not go through a carbocation because we do not see arrangements. And because we're actually reacting with the oxygen first, there is no Lewis base sitting around other than the alcohol, and therefore it does not undergo elimination products. So this makes it a very clean substitution reaction. Okay, think about what we also had with the alcohols. If you used a strong base in alcohol, you could get, um, you could, you know, start to consider uh, E2 mechanisms, and we're, but that's eliminated from the system. Okay, so that was a good way to make uh, the the halogen related system is you can do chloro, we can do iodine, we can do bromo there. However, we have a specific reagent that works very well with just doing chlorine, but we can choose what kind of stereochemistry we have. We can choose inversion because it's an SN2 type reaction, or we can choose retention because of a specific, it's a carbocation intermediate, but they're so close together, we always get retention of configuration. Okay. This reagent is called thionyl chloride, SOCl2. Okay. And we've used that to do primary alcohols before, but now we're going to talk about how it's stereoselective in our secondary alcohols as well. Okay. So the idea here is we're going to have a sulfur oxygen bond generated to make things a better leading. We have two possible conditions we can use. We can use thionyl chloride with a drop of pyridine catalyst. Okay, and that's what we call the basic conditions because pyridine is our Lewis base. Or we can do it under nonpolar conditions. Okay, so something like diethyl ether with no base in there. It makes it go through a different mechanism. And because it makes it go through a different mechanism, we have difference in retention or inversion of configuration. So let's do the first one first with the pyridine. Okay. And what we see here is our alcohol is acting as a Lewis base going toward the slightly electron deficient sulfur and creating a new sulfur oxygen bond in this charged species here. Of course, this charged species wants to rearrange somehow and kick out to make it a little more neutral and it'll kick out chloride ion right here. Now, chloride eventually is gonna be used as our nucleophile to displace our other complex, okay? So just keep in mind, this is where our nucleophile was generated. Okay, but now we still have a protonated alcohol, okay? So that's the most acidic hydrogen in our system and therefore the pyridine will come in and remove that hydrogen to generate a salt of pyridine and this neutral alkyl chlorosulfate, okay? So it's a sulfate because there's two oxygens bond to uh, the sulfur and it's a chloro because of obviously the chlorine's there. Okay, no, so now we have a neutral organic species, okay? And the oxygen will not leave as hydroxide now, it's gonna leave as a sulfate ion. 
the sulfate ion is going to be much, much less basic than the hydroxide ion and is a, therefore a good leaving group. So the next thing that we have happen here is we have another equivalent of that pyridine come in and bond to that sulfur in order to kick out the second chlorine. Okay, when we kick out the second chlorine, we end up with this neutral molecule here. This is a pyridinium alkyl sulfate. Okay. So now we have two equivalents of chloride ion floating around. One's probably gonna be bound to the pyridinium salt here, but the other one, wherever it might be, is gonna act as our nucleophile, okay? So the next thing that happens is our chlorine comes in and does an SN2 reaction, which is why we get inversion of stereocenter. And we kick out this neutral speed, this charge speed. No, I guess it's a neutral species here, which rearranges to form SO2 and regenerates pyridine. Okay. So see how the pyridine was regenerated in the system there. So that's why. So because we have this formation of this neutral species that's a good leaving group, and we have that uh, SN2 attack by the chloride ion we have inversion of stereocenter. Okay. So how can we change the mechanism so we don't have inversion of stereocenter? Well, we get rid of the pyridine altogether and it goes through a different series of events, okay? So in the case of thionyl chloride in an aprotic solvent like ether or um, sometimes THF, we, we see is the first thing that happens is we have the acid-base reaction between the alcohol and the sulfur again to generate our same intermediate here. But in the case of this, we kick out our chloride ion and our chloride ion acts as the base to remove that proton, okay? Not the pyridine, the chloride ion. So when the chloride ion does that, it generates this alkyl chlorosulfate. So this is looking very similar in mechanism to the previous one but we've also generated HCl gas instead of that pyridine salt. Okay. So how is it different? Well, now because this is such a good leaving group, we actually undergo an SN1 mechanism generating a carbocation and a chlorosulfate that is charged species that's very close to it. It's the counterbalancing charge. Because we're in a non-polar solvent, because we're, I mean, in a non-protic solvent and it's not very polar, they can't dissociate from each other. So what they do is they actually, the chloride acts as our Lewis base, the carbocation acts as our Lewis acid, and we have an acid-base reaction forming an intermediate here. Now, when the chlorine takes the electrons away from this chlorine sulfur bond, we generate SO2 and our neutral chlorinated species, okay? So when we have our formation of our carbocation, we have what we call a close contact ion pair or an intimate ion pair. And because we're not in a very good solvent, they can't diffuse away from each other. So they're gonna sit there until one X is the base and one X is the acid, generating our retention of the stereocenter, okay? So if we were doing this in a really good solvent that really likes ions, then it probably wouldn't do this. But this is, you know, the, um, the if we did something that hydrogen bonded, it wouldn't do this. It wouldn't do this mechanism. But the fact that we only have dipole interactions with our ether means it's hard to solvate those ions and therefore they get the retention of the stereocenter. Okay, does that make sense? I have a question. Yeah. So in the one that we just talked about, it looked as if the only products were the SO2 and the pyridine catalyst. But then in this one, when we, so when we retain the stereochemistry, we also get it as a product, but when we invert the stereochemistry, we don't get it as a product. Oh, well, uh, okay. So in the first one here, we actually regenerate pyridine, so that's just catalytic, right? Mm -hmm. But we did generate an equivalent of HCl, one equivalent of HCl, and an equivalent of SO2, and our product. So the only difference oh. is that pyridine is the one that's catalyzed. We generate one whole equivalent of HCl in both reactions, 
we generate one equivalent of SO2 in both reactions. Does that okay. make sense? Yes, thank you. Very subtle trick there, but it is true. Both of those do generate exactly the same thing. See, we generated our HCl in the same spot here, except it doesn't have a base, and so it goes off as a gas. And we generate our SO2 at the end as well. Thank okay. you. All right, so this works very well to put a chlorine on those uh, secondary, primary and secondary alkyl halides. The reason we didn't talk about before, because I didn't want to talk about the inversion of stereocenter, so I'm bringing it up now, or the retention of stereocenter. Okay. So the other thing that we have to L that, that does this is because we can do it with sulfates. Okay? Instead of doing these, uh, um, instead of doing this uh, SO2, the chlorosulfates, we can do it with regular sulfates, sulfates with um, uh, alkyl groups on them. And when we do that, we're doing the exact same thing. We're making the leaving group a better leaving group because of the leaving as the sulfate ion which is a much weaker base than the hydroxide. Now, in the case here, because of that close contact ion pair again, we can get retention of configuration with the sulfonates. Note, this is not thionyl chloride. This has a sulfur with a carbon bond on it. We get the same thing in the thionyl chloride in the absence of purity, that, rever that reversion of center. I'm sorry, retention of center, please. Underline retention twice. All right. So there's a bunch of di these different ones we can do. Uh, that R group can be a methyl group and we call that methane sulfonyl chloride. If it's a toluene group or a paratoluene group, we call it paratoluene sulfonic acid. If we have a trifluoromethyl group, we can call that trifluoromethane sulfonic acid. The reason for adding the different groups is we change the acidity of the leaving group. Uh, we change the basicity of the leaving group and we also change the solubility. So we can change the solubility of different things. So the first thing that happens in these reactions is we take our chloro derivative here and we're gonna use our oxygen as our nucleophile. And we're gonna end up generating HCl in all of these and our, our alkyl sulfonate. Okay, so in this case, the methane sulfonic acid is called the mesylate, the toluene is the tosylate, and the trifluoro is the triflate. Okay. So these are nice stable compounds, and then you can isolate those and then react them with a wide variety of nucleophiles. But this first step with pyridine just generates the alcohol, I mean, the, the sulfonate ester. Now, the reason it retains that in making the sulfonate ester is that we're not actually attacking the carbon of the alcohol. We're using the oxygen of the alcohol as the Lewis base to generate our complex. And then we're gonna use the pyridine as our base to, gener to deprotonate our system to get to our neutral species here, okay? So, because we're not actually attacking that carbon center, we retain that configuration at that carbon center when we make the sulfonate, okay? Now, what happens if you do a nucleus SN1, SN2 reaction on this center and lose the sulfate, sulfonate? Well, you invert the center, of course. Okay, so, but just generating this intermediate here, you retain your configuration. And then when you hit it with any nucleophile, you do get inversion of the stereocenter. So you can imagine this is like stopping halfway through of the thionyl chloride step and not actually getting it to react with that last chlorine step. Okay, so <clears throat> questions on why sulfonates make alcohols better leaving groups or those sulfur compounds. So, all right, good. All right, so we also did this in chapter nine where we looked at we could take um, sulfat, uh, sulfuric acid and heat it up and cause these dehydrations, okay? And when we do these dehydrations, we have a couple issues. Number one, you can get carbocation rearrangement sometimes. Number two, 
you try to preferentially form your more substituted alkene. Okay, that's the Zaitsev's rule, if you remember. So we're gonna to try to form the more substituted alkene. So in the case of this uh, tertiary right here, we have a choice of going uh, to one of these external alkenes or the internal alkene. And the internal alkene is more substituted and therefore it's the primary product. Okay. And this secondary here, we have an option of going to the terminal vinyl group or the internal vinyl group in the cis or the trans configuration. Now, remember when we talked about alkenes, the trans configuration is more stable than the cis, and both of those are more stable than the terminal. So that's why our product ratio is predominantly the trans isomer. But it's not very specific. Notice how there's a lot of kind of byproduct here. So there have gotta be some better reactions for doing that. Um, and we usually do that catalytically. All right, questions on reactions of alcohols. So in all of these last few cases, we talked about ways of making that alcohol a better leaving group. In the case of the acid catalyzed dehydration, we're turning it into water as our leaving group, and that's why it's a better leaving group. You can go back and review though. Questions on this. All right, I'm gonna go on to module 11.2 which is the ethers. All right. So um, except for the epoxies, ethers uh, react with very few things, which was why we use them as solvents a lot. THF and diethyl ether are really common solvents because they don't react with a lot of things. They're very stable under basic conditions um, because any alkoxide ion that comes in is going to actually kick out an alkoxide. And so that's a bad leaving group. There's no reason for it. Uh, it's stable under mild acidic conditions, but if you heat it with a lot strong acid, it actually can start to decompose. So it can handle a wide range of, of uh, reaction conditions, and that's why we typically use them as really good solvents. Okay. So the reason we can't do strong acids is that we can actually do a cleavage of the ether esters by um, substituting the oxygen carbon bond with an, a halogen bond. Okay. Now, it doesn't do that by generating the alkoxide iron. It does that by protonating the ether first. We're gonna use the ether as our Lewis base. We're going to protonate it first, giving us the oxonium ion. That means when we have a nucleophile come in and attack, the other half of it leaves as a neutral alkyl. Okay, and we get an alkyl halide. Okay. So the stronger the acid, the better, which means HI reacts faster than HBr, and HBr works much, much faster than HCl. Okay. So if you have these strong acids like HI and HBr, you're going to get acidic cleavage of esters. Okay. So how do we make them? Well, it's kind of the reverse reaction. We're gonna make, we're gonna take an alkoxide ion and we're going to attack something with a leaving group. That leaving group can be bromine, iodine, or some of those sulfonate esters we just talked about in the previous chapter. These are sulfonate esters that we were talking about in the previous chapter. And what happens is it displaces the good leaving group and we generate our ether. So in a solution where we have the alkoxide as one molecule and the alkyl halide as another molecule, it's an SN2 reaction but they have to diffuse to each other and they both have to have enough energy to hit the transition state because it's an SN2, they both have to be in the transition state. And then it goes to products there, okay? So relatively speaking, that's a slow reaction because it has to have all the energy and be in the same place at the same time. Okay. If you have an intramolecular reaction, you have more chances for it to bend back and forth and be in a position to do that substitution reaction, and therefore intramolecular reactions are tend to be 5,000 times faster than our intermolecular reactions. So that means you're gonna see a lot of these forming cyclic ethers preferentially because it's so much more likely for them to 
uh, have enough energy and be in the same place at the same time because they don't they can't diffuse away from each other. All right, so it's just a nice simple SN2 reaction with a nice strong nucleophile of deoxide oxide and something with a good leak. Okay, questions on that? Okay. All right, <clears throat> so a typical compound we would do, we would wanna make that alkoxide with what we call a irreversible base, okay? So basically you take something like sodium hydride, which would generate hydrogen and the sodium salt, or a sodium or potassium metal, which would also eventually generate a hydrogen uh, gas. And that would give you your nice aprotic alkoxide to act as a very good nucleophile. We tend to do these in, in aprotic solvents, polar aprotic solvents. And then we add in our alkyl halide. Okay. Now our um, alkoxide will act as our nucleophile and displace our chlorine generating sodium chloride, and the reaction goes forward. You can do it with the uh, aqueous systems or, or the uh, protic solvent systems, but it doesn't work very well with the, with the straight chain ethers or the non-cyclic ethers. But because of the close proximity, it works very well with the cyclic ethers, okay? Again, it's the same SN2 reaction it's just that once you form the alkoxide, it has nowhere to go, okay? Now, it can form three, four, five, and six numbered rings when it does these intramolecular cyclizations. And that helps it by entropy, creating small closed rings. However, seven, eight, nine are a little bit harder, but you can make them. Okay. So one of the things that happens when you have an ether and you have a spacer in between it and you're trying to do a cyclization, is entropy is going to make competing reactions, okay? So let's say you can form a five-membered ring or a six-membered ring very fast. And so that's one reaction that can happen. But the other thing that can happen is it can go and react with the bromide on another uh, chain. Okay, so that's in competition with the other one. Even though that's a slower reaction to form that bond and the cyclization is a faster reaction, we're actually doing it because we're transferring uh, the proton off of one of the alcohols in close proximity to something into another chain where it can act as a nuclear. So when you have these and your spacer is too long, like in this case, we would have, if your spacer was a four, four uh, carbons here, that would give you a seven-membered ring, which entropically is not favored, and therefore you're going to get that competing reaction on the intermolecular uh, um, reaction versus the int intramolecular reaction. What is a spacer? <clears throat> okay, I'm um, sorry. So uh, this N means we can have uh, any number of carbons here from zero to 20, you know, zero to 100. And so that the number of spacers gives you the, the size of the ring you're gonna get. Oh, okay. That's what I meant, oh, sorry. Because if we look at the one over here, we have uh, it, the N is shown here. If N is one, we get that nice five-membered ring. If N is two, we get a six-membered ring. And N is three, we get a seven-membered ring, right? And when we talked about uh, cyclics, we talked about how five and six-membered rings were favored because of entropy and low ring strength. Okay, understood. All right, so we can have these competing reactions. And in theory, Making a ring is a good, um, is, is um, turning one compound into one compound. And so entropy wise, it's, it's, we're actually losing entropy. If we're taking one compound, two compounds and turning into one compound, we're, I'm sorry, we're maintaining our entropy. If we take two compounds and make them into one compound, we're losing entropy. So we can think of it as a loss of entropy when we go to 
one molecule creating one molecule is no loss of entropy, one molecule, two molecules creating one molecule is a loss of entropy. So, okay. So how does that apply to epoxies? That's a three-membered ring. That's really strange, right? Well, because of the close proximity and the fact that we have the nucleophile coming in anti to our leaving group, it actually works fairly well. Even though there's a tremendous amount of ring strain, the close proximity allows us to use the Williamson ether synthesis. If we have an oxygen, I mean, uh, an alcohol on the one carbon and a halogen on the two carbon, all we need to do is add base. Our nucleophile will come in and close that ring. Again, it's driven by the close proximity and the fact that you're actually coming in with your electrons, notice it's 180 degrees from where our bromine is going to leave. So even though we're forming that strained ring, it happens very quickly with this system. Okay. Now, we also talked about uh, another way to make these when, when we talked about alkenes. When we had alkenes, we talked about using per acids or per carboxylic acids, which is a carboxylic acid with one extra carbon. And the reason, and the most common one we use is what we call meta chloro per benzoic acid. So we have the chloro group here, which is in the meta position. And then we have this extra oxygen here. The reason this works, remember, is that this is partially negative because, I'm sorry, let's do that. This is partially negative because that's what we'd expect the carboxylic acid to be. But this one's partially positive because of its bonding to oxygen. Therefore, this is our partially negative alkene. This is our nucleophile. Our alkene is our nucleophile. And so it's going to go ahead and abstract that second partially positive oxygen add it across that double bond and rearrange to give us our carboxylic acid back or our carboxylic acid without the oxygen on it and our epoxy formation. Um, <clears throat> so that is a second way to make the epoxy. We did it with the Williamson ether synthesis and we did it with a per acid on an alkene. So questions on um, ethers, Williamson ether synthesis, and cyclic versus non cyclic ethers. Okay, so now I'm going to change gears a little bit. Okay, this is going to become much more important next semester as you're doing multi step synthesis. Okay, so this is the introduction to your multi step synthesis that we have to kind of pay attention to. So the idea here is, let's say you wanted to make a product and your product has an alcohol on it and has something else on it that you cannot do the reaction on it because there's an alcohol already in your substrate, okay? So the idea is the reactions that you cannot use a protic solvent, like a Grignard reaction, you can't use a protic solvent. You can't have a proton anywhere near there. Or a reaction where you were doing oxidation and that, and that, and that alcohol would, would oxidize and you don't want it to. So the, the strategy we use is to take that alcohol and convert it to something else. And in this case, we're gonna convert them to ethers. The ethers are much less reactive than the alcohols themselves. And we can do additional chemistry somewhere else on the molecule and then regenerate our alcohol at the end. Okay. This strategy is called protecting groups. We're gonna protect the alcohol, do chemistry somewhere else and come back and retrieve our alcohol. So that whole strategy is going to be used extensively, and we're introducing it here in this chapter. And the ether, because it has such low reactivity to, acid, to weak acids and strong bases and neutral conditions, makes it the perfect way to protect alcohols. Okay. So the first way I'm going to teach you how to protect your alcohols is to make an ether using isobutylene. Okay. So in the case of our alcohol here, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add acid to our isobutylene, which is going to generate a carbocation. 
that carbocation is then going to be attacked by our oxygen of our alcohol to generate our protonated oxonium cation, which when it loses the proton, generates an ether. And in this case, notice we have this T butyl group, tertiary butyl ether of whatever substrate we have. So that is the primary product of our thing. We have a, do have a side product where it can polymerize and mix other things, but the fact is your substrate has this ether on it. What has this done? Okay, that ether is not easily oxidized. That ether is not protic. That ether is not uh, a, a susceptible to nucleophilic attack because it's a poor leaving group. So we've taken all the reactivity out of that alcohol by turning it into the ether. So once we turn it into the ether, then we can do other chemistry on it. So, and then, but, once we're done doing whatever with chemistry we want, all we have to do is do the reverse reaction. Use a strong acid with water. You use strong acid with water to generate your alcohol and your isobutylene group turns into the T-butyl alcohol. So you're hydrating that ether bond using strong acid as your catalyst. So you have to use dilute acid to clip off the T-butyl group. You use concentrated acid to put it on the group. So this is low water, this is high water concentration. Okay. And the mechanism is what you'd think it would be. You protonate the ether, turning it into a better leaving group. You have rearrangement, you have the carbocation leave, which is then attacked by the water to turn it into the T-butyl alcohol. So the strategy is you use the isobutylene, isobutylene to react with the ether, I'm sorry, the alcohol, and deactivate it as an alcohol and puts it into a very low reactivity ether. All right, so why is this important? Remember we had those competing reactions in those straight chains where you had an alkyl halide on one side and an alcohol on the other. And you would have competing reactions where even if you added the alkoxide of one, you would end up with the, the um, possibly reacting in a different way. And so without doing that, and let's just say we started with our uh, three bromo propanol here and we added Eth the alkoxide of ethane, or, uh, ethanol, sorry. You'd expect it to go, oh, okay, well, great. It's just gonna attack here and give us the product we want, right? Well, maybe, and it'll do some of that. But the other thing it can do is proton exchange. So it's gonna basically take the proton away from this and turn the uh, propanol into that nucleophile. Once it turns that into the nucleophile, it can do the very fast intermolecular cyclization. It can do a slower reaction where it attacks another uh, bromopropanol, or it can actually do the reaction you want and have it react with that uh, alkoxide. Okay. So you have these three competing reactions because you can proton exchange with this alcohol. So a better synthesis, a cleaner synthesis of this is to take the alcohol out of the alcohol, okay? So what, we, what do we do is the first step is we take strong acid, concentrated sulfuric acid and isobutylene, creating our product of our T-butyl ether. Now, when we put in our alkoxide, our ethyl, uh, ethyl alkoxide here, it is the only nucleophile available. It, because it's the only nucleophile available, it's going to substitute the bromine, giving us our ethyl ether at the end here. But ethyl ether cannot form a tertiary carbocation. The T-butyl can. So if we use dilute acid, we'll generate the tertiary carbocation, clipping off the T-butyl group, leaving the ethyl group intact. So by adding the isobutylene,
we get a very clean one product only reaction. So this whole concept of protecting one group while you do reaction somewhere else and then re-releasing it is the, is, you know, the strategy called uh, group protection. Yeah. So we're using this isobutylene to protect our alpha. Um, where else could we use this? Uh, let's see. Well, we don't have to use carbon as our only ether. We can use silicon. And so it's gonna make a nice silicon oxygen bond. The great thing about the silicon oxygen bond is there's a couple different ways to clip it off, okay? So in the case of this, we would take an alcohol in the presence of a silicon with three bonds to carbon, but a chlorine. We wanna use the chlorine because the chlorine is a good leaving group. And so our alcohol acts as the nucleophile, displaces the chloride, and then we use a base to deprotonate the uh, al um, oxonium cation there to generate our neutral species here and a salt over here. Okay. This neutral species then, we can do reactions on it everywhere. Again, it's, it's not uh, susceptible to acids or bases, uh, to bases or most nucleophiles. Okay. However, turns out that silicon oxygen bond is weaker than the silicon fluorine bond. And so fluorine can selectively clip off that oxygen bond and to create our silicon fluoride bond and releasing our alcohol at the end as a salt. And then when we add acid, we'll work it up. And the reagent we use for that is what we call T, uh, tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. Basically, you have four bonds to carbons on the brom on the with uh, butyl groups, and then that creates a an ammonium cation, and then the fluoride is the counter ion. Okay, but the key here is that we're using the fluoride as the nucleophile, even though it's not a very good nucleophile. It makes a much stronger bond with silicon, and therefore displaces the alcohol. We can use dilute acid to do this. We can still use water as a nucleophile to displace it. It's not as clean. The fluoride works in like five minutes at room temperature. The acid takes a little bit longer, but it will do it. So this is the kind of the new strategy. Instead of using an ether with an oxygen carbon bond, we're using an ether with an oxygen silicon bond. And we get even greater selectivity in removing when we use the fluoride. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, let's say you wanted to do a reduction of this carbonyl compound, or no, let's say you wanted to do a, a Grignard reaction, okay? You can't do a Grignard reaction on the alcohol because this would deprotonate your Grignard and quench the reaction and that'd be it, nothing would happen, okay? So let's say we wanted to get rid of our uh, alcohol there. So what we do is we take our trimethyl silyl chloride in a little bit of uh, uh, base, this is triethylamine, and that'll generate our silyl ether, our TMS ether, okay? And then we can now attack our carbonyl with our nucleophile to generate our tertiary alcohol. And then just by working the reaction up in acid, we'll regenerate our primary alcohol. So we're generating two different kinds of alcohols on our system, by protecting our primary alcohol first. Okay, questions on that? Okay, so this is the first inkling of what's gonna happen next semester as we do multi-step synthesis. You're gonna to wanna to protect something, do a reaction and then get back that functional group. All right, questions on protecting groups, uh, carbon ethers or silo. Okay, well, that is my last slide on this section. I'm surprised we got all the way through our slides with all the, all the days we had, we couldn't come to class. But, all right, so uh, I do think that I have, let me actually stop, we're, stop sharing right now. Uh, I wanna direct your attention to the Canvas page under files. 
I'm making sure it's there. I thought I'm pretty sure I uploaded it already. Okay. Under files, there should be something called resources. And ah, there is exam three review hot topics. I'm actually going to pull that up because we have time to discuss that. Okay. So in addition, there's also exam one and exam two up there, and that'll be a good review for the final because those are the topics that will be on the final as well. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and start reviewing uh, chapters uh, 8 through 11 unless somebody has a question or two. Okay, let me go ahead and do this and then do this and do. Okay, so I'm going to try to share my screen with the slides from Canvas. Let's see what it does. Okay, I'll make it smaller, smaller, smaller. And okay, there I go. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Desktop one, I guess. All right. So can everybody see the thing that says exam three review? Yeah? Yes. Hey, great, thank you. All right. All right, so if it's not as, okay, let's see if we can get a little bigger. There we go. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover all uh, modules eight through 11. This slide right here, is kind of one of those things that you might want to make sure all those reactions on your reaction table because it has a lot of information in it just there. We're seeing that in most of these reactions, the alkenes and alkynes we did, we did addition reactions, okay? And they had approximately three-ish, maybe four-ish um, mechanisms that would, they would follow. And because of the mechanisms they were follow, they would see whether you get syn addition or anti-addition or whether you get both. So if you form a carbocation, you're gonna get both, okay? Now, if you form a carbocation, <coughs> you still have regioselectivity. You're always gonna form your more, pot, your more stable carbocation. So look for that when you see these things. Then we had a different mechanism with the halogenation reactions where we created that uh, a halonium cation which means we had to have the other thing come in anti. Um, when we did the halo hydrogen reaction, the same thing happened. When we had the borohydration, the fact that it happened all at the same time means we had syn addition. The oxymercurization, demercurization had a little mixture there. <coughs> and then with the osmium tetroxide, we had syn addition. So make sure you can tell the difference between syn and anti addition know the step in the mechanism that makes it either both, either or, or both, and then know that how that will work for you. So obviously the, the um, hydrohalogenation introduced our Markovnikov's rule, okay? Markovnikov's rule says that the hydrogen is going to add first, and when it does, it's gonna generate the more stable carbocation which means the hydrogen will always add to the least substituted carbon. That means your halogen is always gonna be on your more substituted carbon, okay? And I'll get to the thing in the radicals chapter in a little bit, okay? So in the halogenation and halohydrogenation, the mechanism changed. We formed that, uh, um, that halonium ion that generated us, getting us having an anti-only addition of our second material, okay? <clears throat> with the hydroboration, we had two reasons for it to go syn addition where the boron was on the least substituted carbon, okay? The boron's on this, on this uh, syn addition because it adds at the same time, concerted reaction, and the boron was on the least substituted side, both for electronic and steric concern. And it's one of the few ways to generate a primary alcohol because it's an anti markovnikov addition. In the oxymercurization, demercurization, you're going to see the mercury kind of form a bridgehead and give the more positive 
side of that bridge to the more substituted carbon. Okay, so it's regioselective and stereoselective. Make sure that you can uh, do both. Okay, now that leads to the idea that we can selectively choose which kind of alcohol we want to make by the same using the same substrate. If we want it to be the most substituted alcohol, we want to go through a carbocation intermediate, so it'll rearrange and give us our tertiary alcohol. If we want to get our secondary alcohol, note that the mercury is going to try to bridge head on the top and then the more substituted is where the water is going to attack, giving us our secondary alcohol. And in the hydroboration, the boron is going to be at the end of the chain and when we oxidize it off, that's where we get our primary alcohol. Make sure you can selectively put alcohols on primary, secondary, and tertiary centers by choosing the reagent and or substrate. Okay, a uh, summary of that that you should have in there. Then we talked about oxidation states. The more bonds to hydrogen, the lower the oxidation state, the more bonds to oxygen, the higher the oxidation state, okay? And when we did that, we talked about also going not only just adding across the double bond, but also oxidizing the double bond completely away. The first thing we did was that syn addition with osmium tetroxide or potassium permanganate. But if we did it under neutral conditions, we could get the addition. If we did it under too strong of conditions, we actually clipped off the, carboxyl the, the double bond. So in the case of the permanganate, we can clip this double bond if it's too strong. Then we talked about the very selective cleavage, just cutting that double bond and adding two carbonyls to it using ozonolysis. But we have two workups, a reductive workup that allows us to maintain aldehydes or an oxidative workup that'll take it all the way down to carboxylic acids. Now, if you have a tetrastubbed alkene, you get two ketones, but it'll stop at the ketone or oxidize further down to our carboxylic acid. Okay, and then, all right, so that was module eight. Any questions in module eight? <clears throat> Notice we're using some of those uh, same rational arguments for when we move on to other uh, things like substitution reactions. Okay, uh, module nine was the alkynes. And we saw that for the most part, the alkynes do exactly the same type of reactions, okay? To make them, we need to have two halogens and two hydrogens on two adjacent carbons. They can be in the vicinity of each other, vicinal, or on the same carbon, twins, geminal, okay? Um, we also have the idea that our acetylene is, allows us to have our acetylide ion, and our acetylide ion can be used as a nucleophile. When we add uh, uh, acids across, uh, hydrogen acids across the alkene, we can do it stepwise or we can do two equivalents and it'll do it again, but it adds Markovnikovs. The halogen is gonna be on the more substituted carbon. And if you add the second equivalent, you're gonna get both halogens on that more substituted carbon, okay? When you add halogens across the carbon, you can stop at one or two. When you stop at one, you get predominantly trans configuration, okay? Uh, we can reduce alkynes with uh, catalytic hydrogenation. However, it does not stop at the alkene. Catalytic hydrogenation is used to reduce alkenes as well. So to stop at the alkene, we have to poison the catalyst. We have to use lead and barium salts with quinoline, also known as Lindlier's catalyst. It always gives us cis addition because we have the things sitting on a solid surface still and so we're going to get both of them transferred on that cis addition. So it all it does is take down the reactivity of the catalyst, but still does the same mechanism of the catalyst. Okay. However, if we want the other isomer, we want the trans isomer, we have to change the mechanism. Okay. Remember, we change the mechanism in the trans uh, in the trans alkene because we went through the carbanion and a single electron transfer with the sodium, and that created another radical and another anion in the, in the trans configuration. So you can selectively choose cis alkenes or cis uh, or trans alkenes by 
different reduction methods of alkynes. Okay. Uh, we also found out that they're slightly different, but uh, they're, they're, they're like the reactions that are the alkenes, but they're different, they form different things. For example, you can get diketones and keto acids out of alkenes that you don't get with alkenes, out of alkynes that you don't get out of alkenes. So make sure you know the slight differences between those. All right, which brings us uh, anything about, any questions about alkynes? Okay, so that brings us up to nine. And the most important thing about nine are the, the, these feature slides here. Proton NMR, number of signals equates to number of unique types of hydrogen. Intensity of signal is the relative ratio between the area under the curves it says there's two protons here and three protons there. Position, how far they're shifted downfield is affected by their electronic uh, uh, configuration around them. And then spin spin coupling, N plus one. Then N is the number of hydrogens within three bond lengths of that unique type of hydrogen, which has its own signal. So spin spin coupling and know how to use that for us. Know that when we go further away from zero, we're going downfield. When we're going further to zero, we're going upfield. We'll see that the things that are attached to electronegative atoms are gonna be further downfield. And so relativistically, we'll say that these have to be down here. But even if we didn't know that, we could use the spin-spin coupling to say, oh, there are three adjacent hydrogens to this compound. There's only, to this kind of hydrogen, there's only two adjacent hydrogens to this. And so you can start to pick it out even if you don't remember your downfield or upfield shift numbers. Okay. And then of course, there's some common splitting patterns. If you don't want to try to figure out your N plus one, uh, you can memorize those as well. Okay. Now, when we move to carbon 13, because of the lower isotope ratio, we only have to worry about two things, the number of unique types of carbons and the relative shift of those. They're similar to that of the protons, as far as the order in which they shift, they're just a larger shift. Instead of being shifted over 10 or 15 ppm in the proton, these are shifted over approximately 200 ppm in the carbon MR. But the cell, they're still in the same relative position. Okay. And then in mass, uh, mass spectrometry, the four things you need to remember are the molecular ion peak is the molecular weight of the uh, thing you're analyzing. The base peak is the tallest peak and therefore the most stable fragment. So when we've talked about uh, radicals and talking about whether a fragment would be stable or not as a radical because it has more substitution, think that that's gonna be one of those fragments that's gonna be in our base peak in our mass spec. Hmm, interesting. Um, and then relative abundance of each and then fragmentation pattern. When I mean fragmentation pattern, I mean you have a peak and you have a peak. The difference between those is the fragment that's lost. So if you have a peak and then you lose 15, oh, well, 15, that's a C and three H's. So that's a, a methyl group. It just lost a methyl group. Or it lost uh, 17, which is an OH. Or it lost, uh, you know, 25, which I think is an ethyl group. You know, so you the looking at the difference between peaks tells you what is lost in between one peak and the next peak. All right, questions on spectroscopy. Okay, it's gonna be uh, remembering that when you look at proton NMR, you're looking for connectivity, which hydrogens are which next to which. When you're looking at carbon NMR, you're looking at unique carbons. When you're looking at IR, you're looking at specific bonds and their presence or lack of presence in the spectrum. All right, module 10, we learned about radicals. And we learned that radicals have the same relative stability that carbocations have. So we try to have our radical on our more substituted carbon, okay? We also learned a little bit about bond dissociation energies and that their trends are really close to the trends of acidity that we already find. You know, uh, electronegativity, size, bond strength, hybridization, those kind of things are the same trends we saw in acidity. So we haven't changed anything. We just, you know, reinforced it with a the this, the radical section as well. 
Um, in every radical reaction, there are three steps. Initiation, which is usually done with something with a weak bond specifically between two oxygens. Then that generates a radical on a carbon molecule. Whenever a radical reacts with a neutral species, it always generates another radical. So that's our propagation step. Radical, neutral, radical, neutral, radical, neutral. And then it keeps going and going, going, going. So you run out of things to react with. And then two radicals will terminate each other and the reaction will stop. Okay. Um, we found out that selectivity comes with reactivity. The more reactive you are, the less selective you are. Okay. So fluorine has very little reactivity. It's almost uh, statistical as to where they go. Fluorine is starting to slow down a bit and getting a little bit of selectivity. Bromine reacts slow enough that it has excellent selectivity. Only the most stable radical, the secondary radical, gives a high amount of product. And it turned out the iodine is more stable as the radical than as the bond, and it would be endothermic, so we don't get the product from that. Okay. So that selectivity you can approximate based on the number of hydrogens you have available to react. But then we also figured out that there were a relative selectivity based on the halogens. And when you looked at fluorine, it had almost no selectivity between a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. It was just a little over statistical. Chlorine, we started to see a four to one or a five to one ratio. So we're starting to see a little more selectivity. But in bromine, we had an 82 to one or a 1600 to one. By the time we get a comparison between a primary and a tertiary, we're looking at 99% of it going to that tertiary section. So selectivity gives us, um, is given to us by lower reactivity, okay? So the more reactive it is, the less selective it is, the less reactive it is, the more selective it is, okay? And then we could play around with uh, using things that weren't generating a lot of bromine, and we had what we called NBS or n bromo that generated just the bromine radical, and that allows us to do very careful allylic brominations and benzylic brominations. Okay. Um, okay, we also found out that when we do an addition of an alkene in chapter seven, it always added Makarnikov because we formed a carbocation and the hydrogen came in first, the bromine came in second to that. In the case of radicals, it turns out it goes anti Makarnikov, but for the exact same reason. It forms the more stable radical, okay? And bromine comes in first. That's why it goes to the less substituted carbon. The hydrogen abstraction goes to the second step, which is the radical step. So it follows the same reasoning of creating the more stable intermediate. However, in the radical process, bromine comes in first. In the addition process, just the acid addition process without radicals, the hydrogen comes in first, giving us rise to that Markovnikovs versus the anti Markovnikovs addition of HPR in the presence of peroxides or in the absence of All right, questions on radicals. Okay. All right, then we're gonna move on here. I've got two, no, I have 12 minutes left. All right, great. All right, two module 11, okay? We learned a lot of different things here. We learned about substitution reactions. Uh, we learned about reductions. We learned about oxidations. We learned about ring openings. And then we learned about conversion to other leaving groups and in the ethers chapter, we learned about protecting them to make them worse leaving groups so that we could do other reactions on them. So with the Grignard reaction, by choosing your substrate, you can get two primary, secondary, tertiary alcohols or a carboxylic acid if you use CO2, okay? So all we're doing here is we're using our newly formed partially negative carbon because it's less electronegative than the magnesium. I'm sorry, it's more electronegative than the magnesium, making the negative charge reside on carbon, making the carbon the nucleophile, and it attacks the partially positive side of the carbonate. 
Okay, so that works with aldehydes, ketones, and CO2, but we also learned that it's a little different with esters and carboxylic acids. In the case of esters, we end up having a good leaving group in the alkoxide and we can reform our carbonyl, which means we have to use a second equivalent of grignard to consume that other, the carbonyl formed in situ to give us our tertiary alcohol. So our esters will give us our tertiary alcohol. And the same thing happens with our carboxylic acids. They'll give us that second equivalent gives us a, um, a reaction to give us our tertiary alcohol. All right, we also learned that by deprotonating our alkyne, either with a Grignard reagent or with a, a lithium reagent or with sodium amide, turns it into a very good nucleophile. And it also does addition reactions on carbonyl compounds. Okay, questions about uh, addition reactions with nucleophiles. Notice we're specifically using carbon nucleophiles in all of this chapter. We're creating a new carbon-carbon bond. Okay, so that's why this whole set of reactions goes together, even with the alkyne here, because it all does that new carbon-carbon bond. So then we found out that we can use selective reducing agents. Our selective reducing agents give us a, a way to go up and down this oxidation and reduction band. We found that sodium boral hydrate will only reduce aldehydes and ketones, but lithium aluminum hydride will also reduce esters and carboxylic acids down to primary alcohols. Okay. So in both cases, ketones turn into secondary alcohols. All the other substrates turn into primary alcohols. Okay. And the reason it works is we have that negative hydrogen acting as our nucleus. Then we learned about oxidation. We could choose a chromic acid or a chromic ester to oxidize carboxylic, to, I'm sorry, oxidize alcohols as long as there's a hydrogen on the carbon with that alcohol, meaning only primary and secondary alcohols will oxidize using this thing. Tertiary alcohols do not have a hydrogen and do not oxidize. And we found out using a selective reagent in the absence of water, PCC pyridinium chlorochromate, we could stop at the aldehyde. In the presence of water, that aldehyde gets hydrated and gets oxidized again, okay? But PCC will also oxidize secondary alcohols to ketones, okay? Uh, and then we learned a lot about ring opening of oxiranes or epoxies, okay? If they're unsymmetrical, you're gonna get one, two substitution with any nucleophile you're gonna attack it with, okay? But if we change the reaction conditions, we can get different regioselectivity. In the case of basic conditions, it's going to be a strong nucleophile and it's going to go kinetically at the least steric site, okay? So the least substituted carbon. But under acidic conditions, we're protonating that, um, that epoxy, elongating the bond with the more substituted carbon, meaning the weak nucleophile is going to come in and attack that partially positive carbon. And we get regioselectivity on the more substituted carbon. So make sure you're looking at what kind of solvent and or nucleophile And then when we have, oh, that's the mechanism of the uh, acid catalyzed system. So what we see here is that we're going to get stereochemistry derived from where the nucleophile is gonna come in. And in this case, because that oxirane is still strained, but still on the top of that molecule, the nucleophile must come in from the bottom and we get inversion of that stereocenter. So it's regioselective and stereoselective. All right, and then we show that again here, regioselective and stereoselective. Uh, and we just did this, so I'm not gonna go over that. 
All right, questions on alcohols and ethers. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. And um, if you have questions, go ahead and stay behind. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording and start uploading. And I will uh, be listening for emails on, what is it, Monday. Uh, email me if you have questions.